Uh, thank you. Uh, this evening, um, we're going to be, the, the title, as you can see, is A Buddhist Approach to Death. And part of this comes from, I've had so many inquiries in the last several months to uh, specifically about what, how does Buddhism look at death? And one of the things I realize when we're speaking about death is that people really are asking, what happens after I die? I mean, it, you don't know. people die the same, whether they're Buddhists or Christians or Jews. <laughs> there's, right. no, there's no difference in terms of the mechanisms and the physiology. So uh, when we deal with a Buddhist approach to death, we're really talking about um, what happens after we die for the most part, because that's what religions are more often dealing with. Although I have to say with the hospice movement, we're also dealing with people before death as they might be approaching death. Um, two books that I might suggest to people are that I find really useful. And one is called Breaking the Circle, Death in the Afterlife in Buddhism by Carl Becker. Uh, and this is a fairly um, in-depth look specifically at, at uh, more um, Mahayana perspective on, on specifically death and um, what happens afterwards. And the other is a book that is by Jackie Stone and Mariko Namba Walter called Death and the Afterlife in Japanese Buddhism. And this is a uh, collection of uh, articles that by about, well, by specifically nine people um, from all over the, the idea. But this primarily is dealing with uh, rituals, ceremony, uh, sociology, um, funerals, etc. Not so much about what is, the, what happens from an afterlife approach, except by virtue of the ceremonies that attend to it, etc. Yeah. What is the first book? Uh, the Breaking the Circle. Breaking the Circle. Yeah. Breaking the Circle, Death and the Afterlife in Moves. That's the title of it. Because I, I don't have it listed on the handout. No, it's not Those two. Handout. So, <clears throat> anyway, so as I said, what people really want to talk about is what happens to us when this spark of life is extinguished from a physiological perspective. What happens from a Buddhist perspective? And therefore, most of the discussion well, is not about death itself, but what happens afterwards. So maybe if I were, maybe it's, it, this was a bit uh, not, maybe I should have called it a Buddhist approach to the afterlife, but that's not what I called it. Um, so we need to know that there are many forms of Buddhist understanding and explanations. Why don't you go to the next slide? <clears throat> so, as you can see, there are many forms that Buddhism, Buddhist understandings of death take. And Buddhism originated in Asia, and the assumptions that are made in this discussion are assumptions that are inherent in a worldview which is non linear, non theistic, and cyclical which is an Asian perspective. Um, and so there are also many forms of Buddhist understandings and explanations. For instance, one of the major areas of Buddhism, matter of fact, the largest single group of Buddhists in East Asia are Pure Land Buddhists. And Pure Land is a specific view of what happens after death. But I'm not even going to discuss that this evening. Because that's a topic all in and of itself, which I've, I've done before, but I'm not even really going to discuss that. So that there's different worldviews um, depending upon which form of Buddhism. And these differences are due to historical developments, uh, such as the transition between Nikaya Shasana and the Mahayana, and again to Vajrayana. Culture plays an important role, whether we're dealing in China or Vietnam or uh, India, etc. Um, and Buddhism is also conditioned by the indigenous traditions, and I think that quite often we 
fail to recognize that the indigenous traditions that are present before Buddhism was even introduced, and yet again by outside forces such as colonization and the influences of popular leaders. And just to go back for a moment to the idea of the indigenous traditions, one of the things I think that's really interesting is, is how Buddhism, when we look at it, and we can look at it as, as death as sort of a case study in this, how did Buddhism adapt and then transform some of the indigenous religions, whether it was in China uh, or in Tibet with Bon or in Japan with Shinto, et cetera. These are all really part of it. And uh, Chris and I, in, in a conversation we're having um, just uh, yesterday, I think maybe two days ago, we were really talking about how we often have people with the expectation, well, I really want to know about Buddhism. I don't want to know about all this other stuff. But the fact of the matter is, all this other stuff is part of Buddhism. And Buddhism changed all that other stuff as well as being changed by it. And so it's really important to recognize that. And when you're dealing with death, you're dealing with one of the most intimate existential issues that one can deal with. And so all of the indigenous traditions had something significant to say about death, where they treat it, the way they, they, they um, discuss it philosophically, the way people respond to it, et cetera, et cetera. This presentation tonight will be used as a Mahayana Vajrayana approach based upon both the tradition and the current Japanese Tendai teachings. Though I will make a few references to other traditions when there are major <coughs> distinctions. It's not intended to be all inclusive of Buddhism. So, if, because if it were to be all inclusive of Buddhism, this would have to be a semester long course, not just an evening's discussion. Um, so, it's beyond the scope of this short discussion this evening. Next, please. <coughs> So what is death from a Buddhist perspective? And I want to start with what is common to all of Buddhism. Here's a short list of what is common to all of Buddhism. And Shakyamuni Buddha taught, all of us will die as a part of the natural process of birth, illness, old age, and death. And we should always be aware of the impermanence of life. Life is something that we all cherish and want to hold on to. And when we talk about it as a natural process, um, Impermanence is one of the three marks of Buddhism, the other marks being um, non-self, anatta, uh, impermanence, and what am I leaving out? Dukkha. Thank you. Dukkha! How can I leave out Dukkha? Um, in the common perspective of Buddhism, all of Buddhism, so we can say this is true of all the Buddhist schools, Death is not the end of life. That's how we often think of it. It's the end of this personal, provisional self. It's the end of the body that we inherit in this lifetime. But death is not the end of life. And I think that that's something that I have to look at and say, we get the idea that death is the end of life, really from an Abrahamic tradition perspective. That is that is the perspective in the Abrahamic traditions. On the other hand, one would suggest that all of the Abrahamic traditions somehow weave into that some form of an afterlife that is eternal. That, and we'll discuss that in just a second. The fear of death um, stems from our fear of ceasing to exist, losing one's identity, and a foothold in this world. That's why we fear death. We're fear of losing, a fear of losing our identity. I'm not talking about our fear regarding someone else's death, the fear of our own death. <laughs> the ego, which may serve us very well in our day-to-day -day lives in this particular provisional reality, is a hindrance to our understanding of the cyclical nature of all life in the universe. That's not my opinion. That's a Buddhist, a Buddhist view. So, next, please. So, what happens after death? 
begin with, we have to say that rebirth and karma are fundamental Buddhist teachings. The manner in which this occurs varies according to the type of Buddhism. But rebirth and karma are fundamental. Very briefly, Buddhists in Theravada countries, such as Sri Lanka or, or Thailand, as an example, think that rebirth takes place immediately after death. One dies, rebirth occurs right after. And in the Mahayana schools, the period between death and rebirth lasts for up to 49 days. And this exact length of time varies between different Buddhist traditions and involves three intermediate existences between death and rebirth into another realm. In Japanese, this liminal state is referred to as Chu and in Tibetan, Bardo. And, and typically we'll have heard, if anyone who's, who's been exposed to the Tibetan Book of the Dead will have read about the Bardo states. Chu is just the Japanese term for the same thing. <clears throat> the first the, of the, I'm just going to talk, there are six Bardos, or Chu. There are six altogether, but regarding death, there are three. The first is the moment of death itself at the time that one dies. That's the first bardo. And bardo is, like I say, is a liminal state. And the in this case, the consciousness of the newly deceased becomes aware of and accepts the fact that it's already died. According to some commentaries, this may last for approximately three days. And it reflects upon one's past life. Now, here we get into some really interesting uh, issues. And, and keep in mind, we're not dealing in metaphysics here. This is not viewed in a metaphysical fashion whatsoever. This is, do, this is dealt with in Buddhism in a purely um, physical context. Um, because we're dealing with consciousness. And in this, in this way, consciousness is not viewed as metaphysical. Consciousness is viewed as physical. Um, and, and we'll have more to say about that in and a little bit later. So in the second of the three bardos, so there's the first bardo in which, and it, it's really sort of rather interesting. Um, in this state, one is not aware that they're dead, necessarily. And so you'll be sitting there in your chair, but you're dead. Somebody comes and sits on the chair, and you're thinking, why are they sitting on my lap? Why don't I feel I'm sitting here? That's when it begins to dawn on you, there's something happening here that's not normal. That's, that's really the, the teaching. The second bardo, or chu, it encounters frightening apparitions. In the second, there are various types of sounds, loud, Sounds, you know, clanging sorts of sounds. You know, I, I picture really bad heavy metal music in the background. Um, but it's, you know, <laughs> that, that sort of thing. And Trump. And, <laughs> and, and, he doesn't accept the moment of death, period. I mean, he doesn't accept it. And there are different paths. That, so there's different sounds, bright lights, frightening apparitions, the, the appearance of, of what would see monstrous beings to us, that sort of thing. Um, and there are different paths that one can go down. In other words, one is in this second. You can go down the path to the left, the path that's in the middle, the path to the right, et cetera, et cetera. And if you read the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, you will read that this is what is done for the person who has died, is it's an instruction. And it literally says, Here's what you see. Here's what you hear. Here's how you respond to it. It's a kind of it's a kind of roadmap and a manual that is being read to the person who's died, helping them transition through this and choosing the correct path. Because the correct path will determine whether one has, has a good rebirth or not. I shouldn't say one because it's not one that's having a rebirth. It's not the self. So that consciousness has a good rebirth. Uh, the third is when the consciousness becomes in another body. 
And typically this could be the consciousness could be at the moment of conception or shortly thereafter. Uh, I've determined this is with a group of, it, it was really funny, I was at a, um, a conference in Chicago that was on the grounds of the first parliament of religion uh, in Chicago. It was a, a, a um, anniversary of that event. And so there was a whole interfaith group there and I was one of the, the people invited to Part of that, and the um, we, we there was a social gathering afterwards. Uh, after the you know the first day's events, there was a social you know wine and cheese and that sort of thing. And and a fellow from the Vatican, uh, a Hindu Sanskrit scholar, uh, and a um, um, two two Hindus and myself ended up getting involved because the person from the Vatican was doing his thesis on when does life arise. And so I determined, and, and he specifically was waiting since I'm you know, a human biologist, I, de I determined, not arbitrarily, but that it must be during the blastocele stage when 64 cells have been formed. That's when life is because... Um, well, I won't go into the whole thing, but because before that you don't have a sufficient mass to receive the consciousness. That's really what it comes down to. We're dealing with physical properties here. We're not dealing with metaphysics. There's enough of a neural network. There's enough of a neural network, exactly. Yep. A neural network, but also cellular, cellular network. So the third state is when consciousness becomes in another body. The concept of this liminal state arose soon after Shakyamuni Buddha's death. So this wasn't a teaching from Shakyamuni Buddha himself. And there's some indication that it may have actually been derived from a Vedic teaching and it was adopted by uh, the Buddhists. Um, and some of the early school Buddhist schools didn't accept that liminal state, um, whereas some did. And virtually all the Mahayana schools since the first century CE accept that view of the what we would call Chu. Chu from a Japanese perspective. That we can die. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's definitely uh, same Tibet. as the Tibet. It, it it's very similar to the it's not exactly the same because yeah. there's cultural differences and stuff, but it's virtually it's pretty much the same. Yeah. Same idea at the very least. So, next slide, please. Here's where we really get down to that. It's not a long slideshow because I, I, I anticipate there's going to be a number of questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the first question is what is it that's reborn? If we're talking about consciousness, what is it that's reborn? Buddhists, unlike most religions, do not believe in creator God or an eternal or everlasting soul. And this non-self is referred to as anatta. Buddhists believe that there is no permanent self or soul. And because there is no unchanging permanent essence or soul, Buddhists often refer to this energy or consciousness being reborn rather than the individual. So what's reborn is not Joe. Or Mary, it's a consciousness that is, that experienced the karma of the life that had been lived that's being born into someone else. It's not identified with the person. So if we're dealing in Christianity or if we're dealing in, in Hinduism, for that matter, there's an eternal soul which is being reborn, or that is not being reborn necessarily. But that is is being born into in the case of of Hinduism that's being born into a specific heaven to be reborn on earth. We won't go into that. That's a separate discussion also. But that's identified with the person. What the Buddhist and this is where Buddhism and Hinduism really separate in terms of philosophy from a Buddhist perspective. Non-self means that. Once Joe has died, that's the end of Joe. 
what is reborn is a consciousness which was not necessarily Joe. It happened to be what was animating Joe during that period of time. If we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. So, as you can see, um, no self does not mean the lack of life. Rather, it means that our physical bodies are elusive and impermanent combinations of the five aggregates. And this comes from Master Sigmund Jung. It means that the, our physical bodies are elusive and impermanent combinations of the five aggregates, skandhas, form, feeling, perception, mental formation, and consciousness, of the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and wind. And this combination exists provided that the rights of right causes and conditions are present. Thus, our physical bodies do not have a substantial self. That is what is meant by no self. That's Master Sing Kun. Um, and here I'll quote, I'll quote Pima Chodron, the Tibetan nun. For instance, if Rosa sees a mountain, Rosa is here and the mountain is there. There are two separate things. Whatever Rosa sees, hears, smells, tastes, or feels seems like an object separate from Rosa. So Rosa is looking at something else, mountains. This is how things appear to us. There's a sense of division between me and everything else. I'm looking now at the light in the room. And there's a separation between myself and the light because that's the object and I'm perceiving it. There's a sense of division between me and everything else. The experiences keep changing, but I always, re I always seem to remain the same. I can turn the light off, that changed, but I haven't changed. The light has. So our perception is that I'm the constant and everything else around me is changing. There's something about me that feels like it never changes, period. But when I look for this unchanging me, I can't, find, I can't pin anything down. That's according to, to Pima. This, by the way, goes back to a very um, important concept within Tiantai and Tendai Buddhism. Our life is in constant flux of one conscious moment to the next. In other words, when you woke up this morning, you had from moment to moment to moment to moment a change in the nature of reality from the time you woke up until this present moment. And as you've been sitting here, you came in here half an hour ago, we'll say, in that half an hour, there are many, many moments and you've changed from one point to the next point to the next point to the next point. You don't perceive that change because you're standing still. Everything else around you is moving. That constant flow of one conscious moment to the next is what Chi Yi referred to the sixth century de facto founder of Tiantai Buddhism, referred to as 3,000 realms in one moment. That's exactly what he was talking about. We have this moment to that moment to that moment. Each moment, there are 3,000 realms. That's what he was talking about, that continuous flow. And we make choices. The single thought moment is always changing moment to moment. Now, our brain knits that together into a consistent whole so that we feel like we are holding on to the same stuff all the time. It's what, um, what's what Pima Chodron re refers to as the magical illusion. It's an illusion that these moments are together. It's actually each one is distinct. This moment to the next, to the next, to the next is a distinct entity. The brain puts it together so that we can function. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to function. We wouldn't be able to pick berries from the 
berry patch, so to speak. So even the physicality of a body is changing. Stop and think about this. Every cell in your body, every atom in your body is continuously changing. The human body is in a constant state of regeneration from the cells in our skeleton to the nails on our toes. One of the things that I like to, to say in one of my human biology classes is to remind everyone that if you take all the cells that your body sloughs off in a week, it would fill a 10 inch pie tin. And you wonder why your bathtub gets stuck up. <laughs> no, I don't you're doing it externally, you're doing it internally. It's, it's equivalent to a 10 inch pie pan. That's the number of cells that our body sloughs off. The cells that you have right now, there's not, well, you're under 30 years old. The only cells that you had when you were born are a few of the brain cells. Everybody else in this room is over 30. Every cell in your body has I been. I thought a woman is born with all of her eggs. That's well, that's a different that's a different issue, and they run out. That's different. That's called menopause. Yeah. Right. That's called men that's called yeah. menopause. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. But those but those are not the cells of your body. Those are the cells that she's going to be giving up. Okay. And and so and well, not only that, but just keep in mind that we possess in this body somewhere in the vicinity of 10 billion cells, but only 10% of them are us with our DNA. All the rest of them are, are Bacteria, mites that are in, in our, in yeah. our uh, you know, what is this called? Eyebrow. Eyebrow. Your microbiome. This is part of rebirth. Oh, that's rebirth. This is part of rebirth. Your body is continually changing. It could be a season. It's not standing still. That's part of rebirth. We do, we don't think of it that way, but that's part of that's part of what it is. So, and you are reborn continually. That's the point. You are reborn continually. Exactly. You're thinking of the self. The self thinks it's standing still, but the body and, and everything within you is continuously changing. The notion of the self is standing still. The ego, if we call it, if we call it that. The ego is standing still. So as what continues across lifetimes is a dualistic consciousness, and that's what I was describing with the Pima Children piece that dualistic consciousness of the object that I see and myself. Venerable Rapola, well, Walpola Rula explains it like this. What we call death is the total non-functioning of the physical body. Do all of these forces and energies stop to, altogether with the non-function of the body? Buddhism says no. And this comes, by the way, from what the Buddha really said. He later goes on to say, when the physical body is no more capable of functioning, energies do not die, but do not die with it, but continue to take some other shape or form, which we call another life. Now that's Walpola's, um, not, that's not his take. I would, I would say that that is his explanation of what those sutras say. Um, Interesting enough, Raul, in a blog that I read, I, I, I was surprised that he has a blog, likens this to Doctor Who. So for those of us who are Whoians, um, that's a long-running BBC series. The Doctor has changed through the years into a different physical form and acts differently, but is still the same stream of consciousness. And while he's a fictional alien in the TV series, dependent on causes and conditions, he encounters. In other words, it's really interesting. You know, I, I the, the three things that I think that most students could watch and, and really get a good education in Buddhism are Star Trek, Star Wars, and Doctor Who. <laughs> those three those three movies and serials, I think, are so filled with Buddhist concepts. Uh, you know, 
we were we were discussing the Vimla Kirti Sutra and the room in which Vimla Kirti exists in, which is the TARDIS, which is the same the TARDIS is Doctor Who's vehicle for going through time, space time continuum. That's what the TARDIS stands for. Um, and in this case, I found it really interesting that that um, well, Paula Rula. Uh, must be a Doctor Who fan because he feels that that, that Doctor Who emulates uh, what happens in this rebirth process. But take it in a fun way. It's not intended to be rooted in reality or even Buddhism. Doctor Who, after all, is an alien. Our becoming will continue and seek out a new body and rebecoming where there will be where one is born as a result of past accumulations of positive and negative actions. And one's rebecoming is a result of one's past actions. So that actions determine the rebecoming of the consciousness, not of the person, of the consciousness. And again, back to Pima Chodron, who writes, and I quote, Even though our thoughts are as elusive as mist, how can they cause us endless, unnecessary problems? How can they make us worry, get jealous, quarrel with others, get euphoric and depressed? Meditation gives us a way to see the slipperiness of our mind and our notions of me, in quotes. When we practice meditation, we gradually accustom ourselves to how experiences constantly flow. We see that this happens even though we cannot pinpoint any subject who experiences them. From this point of view, there was no fixed being who goes through the bar nose. Another way of saying this is there is no continuous individual who experiences life and death. No one who dies. Life and death, beginnings and endings, gains and losses are like dreams or magical illusions. Next. And in conclusion, <coughs> Birth and death are only notions. They are not real. The Buddha taught, there is no birth, there is no death. There is no coming, there is no going. There is no same, there is no different. There is no permanent self, there is no annihilation. We only think there is. Ask a cloud, and this is from Thich Nhat Hanh. Ask a cloud. What is your date of birth before you were born? Where were you? If you ask the cloud, how old are you? And you give me the date of your birth, you can listen deeply and you may hear a reply. You can imagine the cloud being born. Before being born, it was the water on the ocean surface, or it was the river, and then it became vapor. It was also the sun, because the sun makes the vapor. The wind is there too, helping the water to become a cloud. Cloud does not come from nothing. There has only been a change in form. It is not the birth of something out of nothing. Sooner or later, the cloud will change into rain or snow or ice. If you look deeply into the rain, you can see the cloud. The cloud is not lost, it is transformed into rain. And the rain is transformed into grass, and the grass into cows, and then to milk, and then into ice cream you eat. Today, if you eat an ice cream, give yourself time to look at the ice cream and say, hello, cloud, I recognize you. <laughs> so from a personal perspective, we think of life and death because we think of it in relation to the ego, which is not letting go. The ego wants to continue. It's attached to the sensate that we all experience. The ego is not the self. There is no self. The ego is a convenient apparatus for allowing this vessel, this corporeal stuff, to function in the world. But the ego is not the self. We think of it as the self. And what we look at when we look at death is we look at those we love. Who die. How does that affect us? We're no longer with them. And it's natu natural to grieve 
the loss of a family member or others we knew. And we must learn to adjust to living without their presence and missing them as part of our life. And that's truly tragic. The death of a loved one, friend, colleague, or a neighbor is a terrible, painful event. As time goes on and people we know pass along the journey of life, we are reminded of our own inevitable ends in waiting, and everything is a blip of transience and impermanence.